Hi, this is Lori Klein from the College Essay Writing Center, and I'm here today to help you revise your rough draft. You've written a rough draft of your personal statement, and you're going to take it to the next level. What I need to tell you is that it's going to take a little time and attention. So get ready to go through a process that, frankly, if you use it throughout your academic career, you are going to learn how to be a better writer, and that's going to serve you well in your entire life. So let's face it, you probably have a terrible rough draft. You sat down, you wrote something, and now you just don't know what to do with it. You're thinking about its structure, you're not sure about your grammar and usage, you look at your sentences and they sound a little bit the same. Now it's time to dig in and do the work of revision and take that terrible rough draft and turn it into something else. Here's what we're going to do today. First of all, I'm going to ask you to read your story aloud. Then we will evaluate the structure of your essay. We are going to look at transitions and make sure that you have a fairly even flow within your essay. We are going to interrogate sentences, question them, wonder about them, look at their beginnings and endings. And then I'll have you examine every word of your essay. Finally, you are going to need to go back and revise and come up with a really great second draft. It's not your final draft, but it's your second draft. Here's your first task. Read your essay aloud. Now, you can do this in your room. They're going to hear you talking to yourself. They're going to wonder what's going on in there. That's okay. Let them wonder. Read it aloud. You have to hear it. When you hear it, italicize everything that you think, ah, it's not so great. That needs some work. Do this slowly. Read it through once out loud. You can print it out and make marks on it and then go back to your document and italicize those moments when you're thinking, I don't like the way this sounds, I'm not sure how to take it to the next step. Here's your second task. Evaluate structure. So you wrote a story and you probably wrote some sort of reflection and I hope that you put in some kind of insight into who you really are. Before you did that, you should have done a pre-write where you kind of laid out the structure. But you might look back and say, wow, what I wrote doesn't look at all like the pre-write I did. I want you here to take a few minutes to look closely at the structure you have in your current form of your essay. Did it match your pre-write or is it different? Just to remind you, here are what some structures look like. For instance, this is a particular kind of essay, beginning with background and voice, moving to reflection, then a powerful story, and ending with an insight. The insight had a neat little reference back to the reflection that was in the second part of the essay. Your essay might look like this. But your essay might look like this. You can see here that this particular essay started right with the story, then gave some background to the story and really showed the voice of the writer, and ended with an insight and reflection that referred back to the story. The important thing to know is that every personal statement really should have these five elements. Background, voice, story, reflection, and insight. Have you included every part in your essay? You might have skipped a lot of background or given it very briefly. Certainly though, you should have story. And you might have one or two or three. And we've got to have the insight because it shows us who you really are. And that's what everyone wants to know. Here's your third task. I want you to go through your essay and mark transitions. I want you to bold the end of every paragraph and the beginning of the next and then read them aloud. There are ways to transition. 
You can use a transitional word or phrase like however, therefore, in addition. All of these words are words with which you're familiar. There are lots of websites that will give you more if that's helpful. This is the simplest way to link paragraphs and it can be very effective. A better method is to bring the last idea forward to begin the next paragraph. You end with a particular idea and then the next paragraph has a hint of it or a mention of it. Now you might not want to do any of these things. You could frankly just switch gears entirely if you want to make a stark point. And you might want to do that at that insight moment of your essay. Let me show you a simple example of a transition. If you look at this particular essay, um, the writer began by giving a little background information, and this particular transition is one of the simple ones. If you look here at the end of this paragraph, I've gotten into all of it one way or another, and I can hardly imagine a time when I listened to anything else. Looking at my life, however, it seems as unlikely as possible that I would listen to country music. The however, that you see right here, is a transition word, and it helps the essay flow from one paragraph to the next. Here's another example of a great transition. This essay begins with a fantastic sentence. I was standing outside a bright orange tent in my underwear. It was morning, but only in a vague sort of way, the sun still reluctant to float into the drizzling sky. Mosquitoes were drowsily plucking at my bare skin. I was staring at a bear. Note that there's no transition right here. There's no transition right here because in this particular moment, we don't want to interfere at all with the storytelling. And it's a dramatic moment. Now we have a nice transition. Only a minute before, I'd been in a deep sleep, inspired by long days of paddling and large meals of rehydrated veggies. Only a minute before is a nice transition that gives us some backstory. Okay, so here's your fourth task, interrogate sentences. I want you to make a list of all your first words. Stop the video. Go and look through every single sentence and write the first word of every sentence at the bottom of your document. You shouldn't have the same word beginning two sentences in a row, unless you're intentionally using a rhetorical technique known as anaphora. Now, what's anaphora? Charles Dickens used it in the very famous beginning of A Tale of Two Cities. It was the best of times. It was the worst of times. It was the age of wisdom. It was the age of foolishness. It was the epoch of belief. It was the epoch of incredulity. It was the season of light. It was the season of darkness. It was the spring of hope. It was the winter of despair. Anaphora is a very effective technique because of the repetition. As a reader, we realize that something was happening over and over again. And Charles Dickens, of course, does this in an interesting way by really using oxymorons, complete opposites, to show us the confusion of the time. Now, look at sentence endings. Make a list of the last word in each sentence and make the list below your document. You shouldn't have the same word ending two sentences in a row unless you're intentionally using the rhetorical device known as apostrophe. It's a very helpful device and you might want to use it. So what is epistrophe? Famously, Abraham Lincoln used it in the Gettysburg Address when he wrote, and the government of the people, by the people, for the people, shall not perish from the earth. Again, epistrophe, like anaphora, uses repetition to help us understand the importance of a particular phrase. Here, the repetition is, it's the people, it's the people, it's the people who are important. That's vital to democracy and something that Lincoln 
truly wanted to convey to his audience. Here's another way to interrogate your sentences. I'll be intrigued to see what you think of this. I want you to go to the website, Analyze My Writing. Go to the website, Analyze My Writing, and look at text statistics, common words and phrases, readability, lexical density, and passive voice. I actually want you to take screenshots of your findings and then put them right in your document. You'll be able to refer to them then instead of having to go back to the site over and over again. Let me show you how this works. Okay, so here is the site to analyze my writing, and I'll show you an example of what I'm talking about when it comes to analyzing your writing with a computer, which can give you information that is really gonna help you be a better writer. So you'll see that I pasted right here the essay about the bear. And once I ask it for basic text statistics, I press Analyze Text. Look at the information it gives me. It's fascinating. The word count, the sentence count, the character count. You can see some important things that might help you improve your essay. One is, do you have quotation marks? Quotation marks are dialogue, and dialogue is going to make your stories more effective. Do you have any question marks? This writer doesn't have any question marks. Question marks are good. Exclamation marks can be troubling, but when they're in dialogue, they can be very effective. Here you'll see the average word length. You can see it's, it's four letters long. Interestingly, you can see the standard deviation of word length. And one of the things you should keep in mind is you don't want all your words to be small and you don't want all your words to be big. Having a standard deviation in the 2.5 range is excellent. 2.37 is not bad. Um, certainly, I would take a few minutes to look at whether I had enough long words and enough short words to give the writing some sparkle. Sentence lengths gives you really fascinating information because you can see here exactly how many sentences have this number of words. If you have too many sentences that, have, that are too similar in length and they are too close to one another within the text, it is going to lull the reader and you certainly do not want to lull the reader. Interestingly, this writer has four sentences in the text that have 11 words. That's fascinating to me, just because that's a fairly standard length of a sentence in an essay, but it's not bad. The standard deviation is interesting. It's 9.41, meaning sentence length deviation. And I like to see numbers that are closer to 10 here, um, 10, 11, 12 where you're really deviating the sentence length. This writer does have one sentence that has three words. The very short sentence is very powerful in the story portion, or even sometimes the insight portion of your essay. The reflection portion often has sentences that are longer. It makes sense, you're being reflective. Longer sentences fit in that particular place. But be careful, because you don't want those long sentences to follow one after another. If we go up to the top of the screen, we can look for common words and phrases and analyze the text. This writer has a lot of the word the. That makes sense. It's the most common word in English. I makes sense. This essay is in first person. And, of, a. Uh, these are all fairly common words to see appearing quite, quite a bit. And I have to say that he doesn't have too much repetition. Um, we have the word wilderness three times, and we have the word something four times. That's interesting because something and through are probably not words that have as much punch. They're a little too vague. They need something more. They need to be more specific. I love the word cloud because here we can see, oh, there are some nice specific words. 
but I'm not so crazy about this something. And I wonder if wilderness might have some opportunities there that we could explore. Also, the word only. I would go through and actually do a search for every only and look closely to see if all of them are necessary in this essay. Here's the 50 most common word pairs in this essay. There aren't too many. That's great. You do not want to have too many. Of the, I was, the tent, these make sense. I was and we were, hmm, those are linking verbs, and I bet that more powerful verbs could be found, but perhaps those are helping verbs and there was a powerful verb after it. We don't know. The rest of the pairings just appear once. Word triples, there are none. That's great. We don't really want a lot of word triples, unless, of course, you're using anaphora or apostrophe. Okay, so we'll go back up to the top. I kind of skip readability. We can look at it. Um, readability is going to tell you sort of the grade level. Um, you know, it's good to be in the ninth, 10th grade reading level. Uh, that shows some complexity. Um, I have to say that if it's 12th grade reading level, sometimes I would say, whoa, back off a little bit. It might be actually a little complex for your audience. At this particular moment, you want this writing to be very easy to read and not quite as dense. It's something to keep in mind. Remember, we should always be thinking about our audience. This is just kind of interesting information, and you can look through it, but I would have to say, in some ways, it's the least fascinating to me. That and the closed test. Okay, let's look at lexical density. When you look at lexical density, what you are really doing is you're looking for sentences that have powerful nouns and verbs. And what happens is when we have sentences that have powerful nouns and verbs, we can pick them out and see the lexical density. You will also see that lexical density includes adjectives and adverbs. It does not include prepositions, it does not include articles. But it's really interesting to see your lexical density. Texts that have lexical density in the 50% to 55% 50 to range tend to be more specific and more powerful. So look at some of those sentences. I would challenge this writer, for instance, to, to examine we were as far into the wilderness as I had ever been. I bet there are better ways that he could have said that that would have been more specific and given the reader something a little bit more to hang on to. Passive voice is absolutely something you should check for. Passive voice is not necessarily terrible, and I, I need you to remember that. There are times when, when it works and when it's necessary, but overall it's a great thing to look for. And this particular detector will go through and find all of the verby words and it will see if it has anything here that looks like it might be passive voice. Aha, here is one right here. Check for passive. In that surreal moment, I realized I was surrounded by something huge, something far greater than myself. Aha, that actually is passive voice. And I would ask the writer to think about whether or not he wanted to say something like, the wilderness surrounded me, or the greater wilderness surrounded me. But we're going to talk about wilderness in a few minutes and how he could have had some interesting possibilities with that word. You don't need to do the closed test. Not important. You need an audience for the closed test. If you want to look at it, go ahead. It's kind of interesting and fun. Here's your fifth task. Examine every word. We have gone from looking at the structure of your essay all the way down to examining every word, the quotidian, the tiny details. I want you to read your entire essay again, and I want you to underline every word that you suspect could be better. There's this amazing writer of literary nonfiction, John McPhee, brilliant man, who's currently actually writing a book about writing. And he says that you should mark not only any word that does not seem quite right, but also 
words that fulfill their assignment, but seem to present an opportunity. Hmm, what might that mean? So here's a way to think about it. I want you to replace the words using a dictionary, not a thesaurus. A thesaurus is going to give you a bunch of words, some of which you're not really going to know or understand, some of which may be rather archaic and be strange in your essay, and you don't want to be that person who sounds like they swallowed a thesaurus. This has got to sound like you. So I want you to look at a dictionary and take a few minutes to think about your words. Let me show you an example. Okay, so you know in the wilderness essay, the writer used it quite a few times, a little bit more than it needed to be. And I wonder about the word wilderness. So I looked it up. Merriam-Webster has a pretty decent online dictionary and it's not just going to give you a list of synonyms. Of course, you could go to the evil thesaurus right here, but I don't want you to do that. Look at the definition of wilderness. A tract or region uncultivated and uninhabited by human beings. An area essentially undisturbed by human activity together with its naturally developed life community. B, an empty or pathless area or region. C, a part of a garden devoted to wild growth. It's also obsolete as a wild or uncultivated state. And the third definition is interesting, but not one that really works here. A confusing multitude or mass, an indefinitely great number or quantity. Shakespeare wrote, I would not have given it for a wilderness of monkeys. That's a sensational sentence or a bewildering situation. Norman Mailer wrote about those moral wildernesses of civilized life. But looking at it, I'm intrigued by the pathless area, an empty or pathless area. You could call the wilderness a pathless land. That's fascinating. That's a way to think about the wilderness that takes the reader to a different place. Wait. It's pathless. No one is there. It's a place where you have to make your own paths. That's quite a lesson. Okay, I'm going to say it again. Dictionary, not thesaurus. Don't do it. Okay, so what's next? It's time to revise. Look at those notes. Look at those markings. Look at the feedback. Look at the screenshots. Look at the lists. I want you to rewrite thoughtfully. Try to change those transitions. Try to change those sentences that seem to start with the same word. Look closely at those words themselves and see what you can do with them and make sure that your structure works. This is just a second draft. You've still got a ways to go. And if you get stuck on something, that's okay because it's the second draft. What's next? That's a great question. We're gonna spend some quality time looking at your essay. We'll craft the beginning and ending. We'll look at sentence structure. We'll talk about high and low subjects. But the important thing is that you're on your way. You came up with a rough draft. You went through it carefully and thoughtfully. And I'm here to help you take it to the next step. It's gonna be a great personal statement. <laughs>